Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I am Ali Budenz with the California Primary Care Association. On behalf of CPCA and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this online webcast, Updates in Substance Use Disorder and Opioid Use Disorder Programming. The purpose of this webcast is to provide health centers with a deeper understanding of the various training and technical assistance support available to them as they develop their capacity to address substance and opioid use disorder in health centers, particularly through medication-assisted treatment programs. We recognize that there are a lot of options and various training programs available to health centers, so we wanted to provide a forum for three of the most prominent organizations to highlight their program and differentiate their curriculum. The three presenters you will hear from today are Judy Bartlett at the University of New Mexico, Project ECHO, Augie Erickson at the Weizmann Institute, Project ECHO, and Kelly Pfeiffer of the California Healthcare Foundation and the Treating Addiction and Primary Care Collaborative. I'd like to thank our presenters for their time and sharing their programs with us. And thank you to everyone who viewed this webcast. Please feel free to contact me with questions on this or other related topics. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Judy Bartlett. I work with the ECHO Institute in New Mexico with the University of New Mexico. I'm a program operations director for the substance use related ECHOs. Um, and today I just want to spend, you know, maybe seven minutes or so <laughs> telling you about how we think ECHO can help health centers address the opioid epidemic. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is I want to hit three main points. I want to tell you a little bit about what the ECHO model is. Um, I want to dive into how the ECHO model can help primary care team members build capacity to address the opioid epidemic. And then I want to get into the weeds a little bit of how you actually connect to these opioid-related ECHO resources. So the first thing is, what is the ECHO model? Um, and to a certain degree, this picture that's up before you really tells you in a nutshell what the ECHO model is. So what you're seeing here is a snapshot of an actual tele-ECHO session. Um, so, and these happen bi-weekly for most ECHO programs or weekly. So in the middle of the screen, you see the hub. So that's a small group of specialists who are focused on whatever disease area you're addressing. And then around that center, you see all of the spokes. So these are live human beings from primary care centers. It could be across a state. It could be across the country, depending on the particular ECHO program. Um, and the idea is that the ECHO model, it's a force multiplication model. So the idea is that a small number of specialists train a large number of primary care team members who in turn serve a large number of patients. So the idea is that a small number of specialists can really expand access dramatically by working with primary care folks. So I want to show you just a brief video that tells you a little bit more about the ECHO model. <laughs> Project ECHO is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection for the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system, from university medical centers and other specialty care sites, to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, community providers learn from specialists. They learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. They acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced, and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO. Changing the world fast. Join us at echo.unm.edu. Are you part of the ECHO? So that's the ECHO model in a nutshell. Um, there's four basic principles that drive the ECHO model. One, we're using technology to leverage scarce resources. We're sharing best practices um, to improve quality and reduce disparity. And we're going to apply case-based learning. I'm going to go into that in more detail in a second. But the fourth key principle is an important one. Um, it's that we monitor and evaluate outcomes. Um, and in a second, I'll take you to our webpage where you can learn more about that. 
But to the right, there's an example of this that's specific to um, opioid use disorder. So Dr. Kamarmi here at the ECHO Institute has been running an ECHO since 2005. Um, and she published an article about some of the results of that in the, the journal Substance Abuse in 2016. And what she showed was the beginning of her ECHO program, which was focused on addictions and psychiatry in 2005, was associated with a dramatic increase in the number of buprenorphine waiver providers per capita. So what you see in this picture is the black line at the top is New Mexico providers in underserved areas, their, their per capita buprenorphine waivers compared to the rest of the country on the bottom. So you can see that there's been, she has served over 500 physicians in this echo and has had a dramatic impact. Um, I'll take you one second to our website where you can see that we, we maintain almost on a daily basis, but at least a monthly basis, all of the different ways that we've explored how ECHO has had an impact on various disease areas. So now I just want to mention that ECHO is, where is ECHO and what all does it cover? Because it's not just focused on opioid use disorder. Um, it's all over the world. There's, it started in 2003 in New Mexico. And it, during these last 15 years, it's expanded to 71 hubs in 33 different states across the nation and a total of 117 hubs across 24 countries in the world. So we, we serve the disease areas from HIV to chronic pain to diabetes, but also we do different types of echoes that are focused, say, on community health workers or focused on nurses or focused on quality improvement. So they're not all just disease area focused. So now I want to tell you what happens during a tele-echo session. So like I said, most tele-echo programs, they're going to meet every week or going to meet every other week. They're typically going to last about two hours. So what happens is the first thing you do is you zoom into your tele-echo session. Zoom is a free software that you download in a matter of minutes. There's no cost to it. And I, I want to emphasize there's also no cost to participating in any ECHO from the ECHO Institute um, or ECHO hubs across the country. So after you zoom in, there's typically a 15 to 20 minute brief lecture by one of the specialists at the hub. Um, we, we want that to really be a small part of the time because most of the learning is happening in the next place, which is the case presentations. The case presentations are done by the spokes. So the spokes present real patient cases. They're de-identified. We don't um, share patient health information. And they discuss it with the network of other spokes. And I'm going to show you um, just one example here. Basic techniques such as motivational interviewing. Participants select cases of patients from their practice who have substance use problems. They submit a written, de-identified summary of the case, which is distributed in advance to the specialists. During the tele-echo session, the participant summarizes the case. Uh, currently today, I think that uh, for opioid use, or pain medications is, is very limited. It's maybe 50 milligrams a day of oxycodone, uh, one of soma, and then just this last week, I finally got her off of Xanax, quickly and on to Adamant. So I think at least from a risk profile, she's doing much, much better. Participants ask for support on a particular aspect of care. He's got a, two substance um, use disorders, the alcohol as well as nicotine, um, and also was in psychiatric care for post-traumatic stress disorder as well as panic attacks with anxiety. The facilitator then asks the other participants for clarifying questions. It is important to invite input from the non-experts first so that these learners are encouraged to think independently about the case. Is she taking the methadone for the pain or for her opioid use disorder? Or both? Next, the facilitator asks for clarifying questions from the specialists. Second thing is, just from a safety perspective, I don't know if you have a lot on program, I don't know if that got mentioned earlier, but clearly coming to it from safety, I think that's really critical. Um, I think that's what uh, Phil was saying. 
Again, the participants are first invited to offer suggestions, followed by the specialists. The facilitator and the specialists use the case material to illustrate important aspects of addiction medicine. Suggestions for possible clinical strategies are summarized and are later transmitted electronically to the presenter. So most of that two-hour tele-echo session is spent on these case presentations. So this, it's a very interactive environment, and the spokes, in other words, the primary care team members, have a large role to play. It's not a passive um, educational environment. It's a very active environment. And as Dr. Kamarmi mentioned in that short video, after these cases are presented, the recommendations are the recommendations both from the specialist and from the network are summarized and emailed to the spoke presenter. And then the last thing that happens after the session is you're going to receive an email link um, with a brief survey. It's voluntary. You don't have to do it. The reason most folks do it is it's a way to get instant continuing education credit. Um, and most ECHOs offer a variety. It can be CME, CNE, CPE, depending on your credential. So I want to be real specific about what you could do next if you are interested in participating um, in this technical assistance. So there's several ways to jump in. We have, let's see, four different bi-weekly ECHOs that are currently running that are focused um, Actually, three of them are focused entirely on opioid use disorder, and the last one is focused on more broadly on addictions and psychiatry. So the first one um, is the HRSA-funded Opioid Addiction Treatment ECHO, and we'll visit that website in a second. That's running out of five different hubs across the country, from the University of Washington all the way to um, New York, Western New York. In addition to those five interdisciplinary opioid echoes, we have two echoes that are specialized on particular populations. So we have one opioid echo that's focused on community health workers and medical assistants. We have another that's focused on the behavioral health component of it, which are for counselors, social workers, and psychologists. So let me jump to our opioid addiction treatment website real quick. And I will show you the URL for that at the very last slide here. It's a very simple website, um, and what you'll see prominently is there's a button here called Register Now, and you can spend literally two minutes to register for, this, um, for one of these opioid echoes. And if I click over to the schedule here, you'll see that the, opioid, the HRSA-funded opioid echo is run out of five different hubs across the country. And the schedules are, are shown here. Um, we try to sort of hit the lunch hour across various time zones. Um, so that's what's going on there. You can also on this website see what our curriculum focus is. Um, a big emphasis of the curriculum, of course, is on medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. We also cover many of the behavioral health interventions that support that. Um, such as motivational interviewing. Um, and you can use this Register Now button also to register for the opioid echo that um, targets community health workers and targets um, counselors, social workers, and psychologists. And I'm going to click briefly on the Benefits tab. So there's a lot of reasons to participate um, in one of these opioid echoes. The main reason, of course, is so that you up your your skills, your knowledge, your confidence, um, and in some ways perhaps up your attitude around treating patients with opioid use disorder. There's a lot of stigma issues that we're all bringing to the table. Um, the other reasons you would want to, might want to participate in these ECHOs is that you get instant free continuing education credits. Um, if you participate for 12 ECHO sessions and present at least two patient cases, you will also get a certificate of training completion from the ECHO Institute and from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. The last benefit is a new one, and we're really excited about it. Um, so nurse practitioners and physician assistants in most states, sadly not all states, um, are now able to become prescribers of buprenorphine um, in the primary care setting. But of course, they have to do the eight-hour waiver training but NPs and PAs have an additional requirement where they have to do an additional 16 hours of training 
and time spent in this opioid echo counts towards that training. So we're thrilled to be able to offer that as a benefit as well. Um, let's see, I'm going to navigate back to my slides. Um, and for the last echo on this slide, the integrated addictions in psychiatry echo, the way you can get involved with that is by, by emailing us. So the last page here, I've just put my name. Again, I'm Judy Bartlett, and I've put the email address, phone number, and website where you can contact us if you have any questions um, about these services that we offer. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hello, I'm Aggie Erickson of the Weizmann Institute. I am pleased to share important information with you about our comprehensive intervention for primary care providers addressing the nation's opioid addiction epidemic. The Weizmann Institute is a research and innovation center embedded in one of the nation's largest and most advanced federally qualified health centers, Community Health Centers, Inc., based in Connecticut. All of our tools and interventions have been designed by primary care providers for primary care providers, grounded in more than 45 years of experience. Our tested and effective approach brings research, best practices, and new knowledge directly to providers, resulting in better patient outcomes. As director of the Institute's Project ECHO Learning Network, I invite you to join us as we expand this model to other health centers. Our approach through our highly successful Project ECHO Telehealth platform uses a combination of tools and strategies to provide support to the care team and help them gain skills and confidence to treat the most challenging issues confronting primary care practices today. The CHC Weizmann Project ECHO is unique in its comprehensiveness and national scope. We locate the best faculty from around the country and link them through our ECHO platform with primary care providers anywhere. It's not uncommon during a Weizmann ECHO session to have presentations from providers located on the East and West Coast. This creates a unique learning community of primary care providers separated by distance but joined by a common purpose of learning together to help complex and vulnerable patients. How do we best manage pain in a patient who uses buprenorphine for opioid dependence who sort of insists that opioids is the only thing or are the only thing that might work? More than 1,000 healthcare professionals from 25 states have taken part in one or more of our Project ECHO clinics since we began this work in 2012. Our pain and opioid misuse intervention includes access to both Project ECHO Pain and Project ECHO Buprenorphine clinics because we believe better pain care is as critical as treatment of addiction to help tackle the opioid epidemic. To make attendance at Project ECHO as convenient as possible, Weizmann runs two Project ECHO Buprenorphine clinics, one scheduled on the fourth Tuesday of every month at 12.30 Eastern Time the other at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Both sessions are 90 minutes long. Providers are able to receive 1.5 CME credits for every session through American Academy of Family Physicians. Project Echo Pain sessions are held on the first and third Thursday of every month from 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. Each session includes a brief didactic followed by a range of case presentations from primary care providers. Providers and their care team members are encouraged to attend the sessions and gain the information they need to confidently manage patients in the primary care setting using a team-based approach. Particular emphasis is placed on the importance of integrated behavioral and medical care. Our project team has continued to innovate and enhance Project ECHO, offering practices additional tools to further augment their learning. Many providers have questions about specific cases and may not be able to wait for the next ECHO session to discuss them. To address this need, we've built a custom e-consult platform for all ECHO participants. 
Weizmann Echo is the only Project Echo with such a feature, allowing participating providers to consult directly with Echo faculty about specific cases in between Echo sessions. We use a HIPAA-compliant direct messaging system that allows providers to submit case consultations to members of the ECHO faculty all day, every day, and receive a response in two days or less. Lastly, participants in Weizmann's Pain and Opiate Addiction ECHOs receive access to our two companion online resources, PainNet and AddictionNet. These two websites provide 24-7 access to downloadable tools and resources, didactics and case presentations from past ECHO sessions, as well as basic learning modules on pain and addiction treatment. Using these tools, primary care teams at our health center in Connecticut have treated more than 1,700 patients with MAT. Around the country, over 430 providers from 25 states have attended our sessions and began offering evidence-based care to their patients. This is a, the most interesting conversation that we're having in substance use uh, care. It's like the cowboys and the ranchers can't be friends. <laughs> the access directed, harm reduction, uh, divided, uh, sometimes openly hostile ideologies. It's got an extraordinary history. And here we are having to discover something very beautiful, which is patient-centered care. But we really have to figure out how to offer both. Yeah. And I think it is just full of learning and discovery for all of us, wherever we, we stand. Uh, this, is, this is a whole new ballroom. And I just really appreciated everything that was said. Thank you. We've impacted the lives of tens of thousands of patients and continue to innovate to create new interventions for primary care. We'd like you to join our community. If you'd like to learn more, please visit our website at www.weitzmaninstitute.org or to call me, Aggie Erickson, at 860-622-1667. Hello, my name is Kelly Piper, and I'm a primary care doc, and I'm delighted to be able to share our experience here at the California Healthcare Foundation related to spreading access to medication-assisted treatment, especially in primary care settings. And whenever I do a talk, I often start off with a story. And one of my favorite stories is, is a story of a woman I'm going to call Kim, who was a patient that I inherited on, on fairly high-dose opioids well over a decade ago. And I saw her for several years and had a lot of discomfort with always wondering, are we doing the right thing with these opioids? She never seemed to be able to get her life together. Every time I talked about whether they were really working for her, there'd be some type of crisis. There was inevitable, you know, lots of tension around dose escalation. And when I left the practice at, from, at this community health center, I actually was not all that unhappy to give up our, my chronic pain population. In fact, when I was medical director of that practice, we had three docs quit within three months because the pain population, they said, was way too difficult to deal with. Well, the funny thing is I ran into her sister years later, and her sister said, you know, Kim loved you so much. You were the best doctor she ever had. You understood her pain. You were so compassionate. And you then assigned her to this new doctor who she said was so difficult and made her taper down these medications. It took her a year. She got to a much lower dose. She struggled the entire time. She missed you the entire time. But I have to tell you, your leaving was the best thing that ever happened to my family. She lost 50 pounds. She doesn't fall asleep at the Thanksgiving table. And her pain actually almost disappeared. And I tell that story because it gives me tremendous hope that in the midst of this opioid epidemic, when clinicians like myself thought we were helping people and doing the right thing, and then ended up creating a population of people who are either opioid dependent or addicted or some place in between, that we can make people better. And and what I found in my own experience and from doctors that I've talked to, sometimes becoming a buprenorphine prescriber is the best thing you can do as a primary care doctor to build your own satisfaction as a clinician. Because it's the one time when you actually are taking someone whose chaotic lives and 
misery made you cringe when you saw them on the schedule, and then you see the best in them in the recovery. So I'm so excited that the California Healthcare Foundation has been working with community health centers to try and implement MAT practices, both because the state desperately needs you. Um, there's so many people who become addicted to opioids, and so few people have access but also because it is really a great opportunity for staff and clinicians to find the joy in seeing people go from a life of chaos to a life of recovery. So the California Healthcare Foundation is, is taking on the opioid epidemic in several ways, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about the ways that CHCF is trying to support community health centers like yours in addressing the opioid epidemic through safer prescribing practices, through implementing MAT in primary care, and through making sure naloxone is available in the community. And we really see that those three things are critical to turn this epidemic around. Safer prescribing, so we, put, we use opioids in fewer conditions, lower doses, shorter durations, and therefore we prevent more people from becoming long-term users. And MAT, obviously, to make sure there's enough treatment so those people who have become dependent or have addiction can get the help they need, and obviously naloxone to make sure we stop deaths in the meantime. The so CHCF has, pub, um, has several publications that might be useful to you. We have a, an FAQ on buprenorphine, and if you go to the slides and click the link, you can access these documents or you can go to our website. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback about that buprenorphine FAQ because it's got a lot of good basic facts. It covers the use of buprenorphine in chronic pain as well as addiction and talks about some of the administrative issues as well as the clinical issues. Recovery Within Reach was a piece we commissioned to look at the different models for primary care health centers and how they implemented MAT, different ways of doing inductions, different ways of using different team roles to help clinicians so that it's not all on the doctor, there's practitioner, but there's a team approach, and then the hub and spoke model, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. And we also have some papers on use of complementary therapies and the role of health plans. A big piece of our work is to provide training and technical assistance, and we were really excited when the federal government gave substance abuse treatment grants to FQHCs, so finally there was a financial incentive for clinics to be able to take on this work, but at the same time there wasn't um, a technical assistance and training opportunity, and like any complex adaptive process, it's not such a simple thing of saying we get paid for it, we can now implement it. And so we set up two learning collaboratives, one with the Center for Care Innovations, and that learning collaborative will be finished in December 2017, but the resources that we've gotten from that learning collaborative are available on their website, on CCI's website. And we also commissioned the California Society of Addiction Medicine to do a webinar series that is just excellent. So even though um, these webinars are, are completed, you can access the recording, you can even get CME for them and they're ongoing once a month on Friday. So do check them out because they've been fantastic, not just on MAT, but also in dealing with some of the more complex pain scenarios we see in community health centers. We also launched a collaborative to help community health centers develop complex care programs using the Camden Coalition as our trainer and technical assistance provider. Um, you can find out more information about the Camden Coalition and the work they're doing across the U.S. and the link I provided. And in this case, we wanted to see what happens if you get a health plan and a clinic to work together on trying to look at different care models and payment models. And then finally, um, we have a program where we're launching MAT in the emergency department with the idea that um, to try and replicate a Yale study that showed people are twice as likely to get um, to stay in treatment if buprenorphine is started in the emergency department compared to if they showed up to the emergency department and just got a referral. And so the idea is that community health centers or outpatient treatment programs would take a handoff from the emergency department once the treatment has started. And there's also information about this program in our website, and we have six counties we're working with um, currently. So if you are in one of those counties and interested in more information, please contact me and I can connect you to the leaders working on that. One of the most exciting opportunities that's currently available is the California Hub and Spoke model. And this is an $89 million program from federal funding that is allowing opioid treatment centers, um, like the ones listed uh, that we normally think of as methadone clinics, to partner with community health centers, primary care practices, mental health clinics, um, social service organizations to create a hub and spoke model. And it's, in many ways, we primary care providers have been doing this 
for years with cardiologists or dermatologists that we manage most conditions and when something gets more complex we involve a specialist and when that someone's been going to a specialist and they get more stable they're handed off to primary care providers and that's the same model that the hub could be a place that could do inductions it could manage more complex patients and more stable people can be referred to the spoke and the spoke can um, manage milder conditions, milder addiction, and when something's more complicated, if someone's not doing well with treatment, um, they can be referred to the hub to get more intensive services. So if you are in any of these counties, I really urge you to connect with that hub if you haven't already and think about whether you can be part of that hub and spoke model because this will allow you to have access to expert addiction specialists to help you with more complex cases and to set up an easy system of mutual referral so that you can receive patients who are stable, you can receive people who need primary care, or you can refer out people who are too complex and make sure that those patients don't fall through the cracks. So CPCA can help you um, find those connections if you don't have them already. And finally, CHCF has been doing a lot of work with state partners because we're very committed that to turn the opioid epidemic around, we need local leaders and we need statewide leaders to coordinate our efforts. So the California Department of Public Health has been doing a, a lot of work bringing together people around the state, meeting regularly and making sure that all state agencies working on the epidemic and community leaders are coordinating their efforts and making sure we stay connected. So they have task forces on policy, data, treatment. They're doing a big communications push over the next several months. So that, that's a great way to make sure that people across the state are, are in sync. We also are supporting Smart Care California, and that's a, a um, partnership between purchasers, essentially Medi-Cal, who's paying for services, Cal Covered California and CalPERS, to partner with health plans and providers to make sure that we're all coordinating um, work-related overuse, and opioid epidemic is one of them. And then, of course, the California Department of Healthcare Services, which is running the hub and spoke system I just discussed. The, um, I wanted to highlight the Opioid Safety Coalition's network. Um, this is, again, something that CHF has been working closely with public health departments, medical societies, hospitals, clinics, addiction treatment, to coordinate all of the work in a county and make sure that that county is staying in sync. Because, of course, if what we found in California is if one clinic says, I'm done treating pain and, and, and says to their patients, go elsewhere, then those patients are flooded to somewhere else. And so unless all the medical groups in an area have similar prescribing guidelines and similar approaches, then the patients ultimately are harmed. So this has been going on for a year and a half. All of the green counties have active opioid safety coalitions, and all of them are working in similar ways to try and make sure that there are better prescribing practices in that county, to lower over prescribing, make sure MAT is available, that there's naloxone available, and that there's efforts regarding prevention. So if you go to our website and hover on your county, the link to the leader of that coalition will pop up, and I strongly recommend you connect to that coalition if you aren't already because, again, it can be a way to make sure that your efforts to implement MAT are coordinated with other efforts across the county and that you are able to find out what are resources there may be. Um, finally, there's some um, great lifelines, and these are um, things I hope you know about already, but the Provider Clinical Support System has free resources and, can, and free mentorship. I know when I was starting to be a buprenorphine prescriber, I was very intimidated with my first few patients and, and counted heavily on experienced providers to help me get through it. And then after the first five, it becomes so much easier. So again, um, we find that for 100 providers trained to do buprenorphine, only half ever do even one prescription. And of those half, most just manage a few patients. And we think with more mentorship and better systems that this number can go up. I also want to call out the California Society of Addiction Medicine. They've got free webinars, publications, and um, great conferences. The Project ECHO is a great free way to get um, expert help, and this is essentially what's called telementoring, where you and other clinics will be on a video conference together either once a month or twice a month, and you can review cases and get didactic help. This was developed for hepatitis C, and it meant that primary care providers could become experts in hep C and have the same ability to build skill and comfort with addiction. And finally, the warm line available Monday through Friday is a free resource where you can call an expert clinician, go over a case, and get help. 
Um, so if you need any more information, please contact me and I'll do what I can to connect you. Um, I'm so excited that there's more interest in MAT and primary care. I'm just delighted to be able to be a part of this work. Take care.